is <laughs> we've got a few uh, behind the scenes issues here. We'll 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 catch up. I'll stop being distracted by them. Um, one of the issues with uh, with banks and with fintech coming on board as part of hey, uh, no, um, I was just saying because but one of the things we're really lucky about with banks and fintech coming on board is that it helps mature the sector a lot more. So we've actually got a whole bunch of um, best practices now that we can draw on in our API design uh, and our technical capabilities. You've been following it along though for quite a while. You, you did some API uh, looking at API style guidelines, for example, and you've got a great resource available for that. I'm sure that plus the rest of the work that you've done has helped influence the um, uh, design of web APIs book that you wrote um, that's, quite, that's popular amongst a lot of uh, API engineers, especially when they're starting in this field. Uh, you've seen the you've seen API lifecycle and design mature quite a bit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, people are more and more interested in uh, the full lifecycle of API from uh, the early beginning, uh, where people start to think about what they want to do with APIs before starting to building, uh, before designing them, and then building them, and then uh, getting feedback from. Uh, consumers to improve them. Uh, before that, a uh, few years back, people, when they wanted to do APIs, just started endlessly designing get slash this and bus slash that without any regards for users and what the API was supposed to fulfill. Right. Wow. Amazing the, the changes that you've seen over the last few years and being a, a crucial member of the community in documenting those changes and sharing best practices. Uh, do you want to get your slide deck on let's, board? Let's try to share them. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. That's fantastic. I'll jump off now and take it away. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And so let's start the augmented API design reviewer. Uh, so hello again. Uh, I'm Anne Lore. So as Mark said, I'm the author of the design of web API, senior API architect at Natixis. Uh, you may also know me as the API handyman. Uh, my job at Natixis is basically helping IT and business people understand and create APIs. And helping people to create APIs implies reviewing API designs. API design review is a vast topic covering many aspects from pure design concerns to cross team governance perspectives and everything in between. If you want to learn more about this overall topic, you should look at my API design reviewer status set. It's a talk that you can find on my blog. Today, we'll focus on my journey to what I call the augmented API design reviewer, which aims to make reviews more efficient, safer, and simpler. I will tell you why and how I automate part of API design reviews using the Open API specification and Spectral, Ayaman and JSON data. When people want to create a new API or modify an existing one, uh, its design must be reviewed. To do so, I meet the API team, they explain you what they want to do with the API, they send me their design, analyze it in depth, I will discuss my feedback, they fix the design, and if needed, we cycle. An API design review has three purposes. First, ensuring that the identified needs are the real ones and ensuring that the design actually fulfills those needs. Second, ensuring that the design offers a good developer experience that is easy to use, easy to understand. Third and last purpose, ensuring that the design has the same look and feel as all of our other APIs and so making our APIs even more easy to use. And this is done by checking the design conforms to our API design guidelines. That sounds like a good plan. So what's the problem? Checking conformance to guidelines means checking that each property name is in lower common case. Checking that schema names does not end with technical suffix such as DTO. Checking Russell's path structure. Tracking non evolvable array of strings. Among dozens of other checks. Checking conformance of a small new API or a small modification is done easily in a matter of minutes. But when there are dozens of them, minutes becomes hours, 
And there is a significant risk of oversight because I'm just an average human being with a very limited amount of concentration. And things can get even worse when working on huge APIs. Hours can become days, and the question is not will there be oversight when checking guidelines conformance, but how many? The problem with API exam review is succeeding to spend the less possible time on guidelines conformance, dump checks, and avoid oversights, while spending as much time as possible on tasks actually requiring a human brain, like working on needs and developer experience. And how do we do that? By augmented API design review works. Hopefully, we don't have to become machines or cyborgs to be faster and more accurate API design review works. All that is needed is a machine-readable uh, machine readable description of APIs and a linter. So forget wiki pages and other spreadsheets. Use the open API specification to describe your APIs. The open API specification, formerly known as the Swagger specification, is a standard and programming language agnostic REST API description format. An, API an open API document can be either in JSON or YAML format, and it will describe API resources, uh, operations, response bodies, and any other thing you need to describe your API. To describe data, the open API specification relies on JSON schema, which allows to tell, for example, that a user object is composed of a mandatory ID, first name, and last name, and also has an optional address, which is defined by another JSON schema. Now that we have a machine-readable description of an API, we can analyze it with a program called Alinta. Instead of reinventing the wheel, I use Stoplight Spectral, which is an open source uh, linter that can analyze data such as Open API documents, Async API documents, Kubernetes configuration files, or any other JSON or YAML data. Linting an Open API file with Spectral command line interface or CLI is quite simple. Open a terminal, type Spectral, lint, followed by the Open API file name. Spectral is able to detect some problems right out of the box without providing any other information than the API description file. For each problem, you get its location, its level, the rule that detects the problem, and a human-friendly description of it. Spectral comes with a pretty fine set of rules specifically made to analyze open API documents. Obviously, your guidelines are probably not the same as the one when done in Spectral, but hopefully, you can design your own rules in order to check that an API design conforms to your guidelines. A spectral rule set is a YAML file, and a basic rule set will contain a, a rules property, and inside this rules property, each rule will be identified by its name. The basic rule is composed of three elements. The first one is the given property, which is a JSON path indicating where in the document the rule will be applied. The current value targets the ID property of any reusable schema. The second one, the then property, describes the controls to be done. Here the control is applied on field type inside the element formed by the given JSON path. It consists in checking the field type value belongs to an enumeration with a single value string. Enumeration is not the only available function. Spectral comes with some other that you can see here. And last but not least, property of a basic spectral rule, the description that tells humans what this rule checks. And this rule checks that the ID property of any reusable schema is of type string. Let's now rerun spectral with our rule set. It tells us that on line 28 of the OpenAPI file, an ID is not of type string. Indeed, in the reusable user schema, the ID property is of type integer instead of string. As you can see, using Spectral looks quite simple. But let's now talk about the real world beyond the hello world. Let's talk about how actually build and then use Spectral rule sets that will help you to secure and speed up your reviews. It would take a day-long workshop to describe all the functions, tips, and tricks I use to build Spectral Rule Set. As I don't have a day for this session, I will focus on the two most important matters that may not come to our mind when using such tool. I will focus on how to design rule sets and how to be sure that they actually work. 
But still, while talking about these two topics, I may incidentally share some tips, but without going deep into details. So look for this tip alert badge. Just like an API, spectral rule sets actually need to be designed. You can't just start from scratch and write random rules one after another. You need to think, you need to have a plan. So if you don't already have API design guidelines, write them, at least a minimal version that you will expand when needed. Look at my lot of API design talks uh, to learn more about that. Once that is done, you can start to express those guidelines as spectral rules. But do not rush blindly. Just like when you represent jobs to be done as a REST APIs, you have to think twice. You must ensure that your role design is actually relevant, user-friendly, and maintainable. To do so, you obviously have to think about rule names and descriptions, but choosing an added granularity, severity, and organization is even more essential. Let's talk about granularity first. If our guidelines tell that all responses are objects and not strings or array, for example, and a get slash whatever slash plural name always returns a list of resources, and this list is represented as an object containing a required property named items, which is an array containing the list of resources, and each item in this list must be an object and not a string or numbers, and when the response is a list, the return object may contain a page property that must provide the current page number and total number of pages. Check all that. We could create a single rule named valid collection schema, telling that a list response must conform to our guidelines with a very long but explicit description. It would target schema of 200 responses, of get operation, on paths ending by a plural noon, thanks to some magic regex filter. And eventually, in the then clause, we could use the schema function that checks that a data structure conforms to a given JSON schema. And so provide it the JSON schema of the expected JSON schema of the response. Huge tip here. What happens if we run spectral again with a rule set containing this rule on this open API file having a get slash users returning an array of user? Spectral detects a problem. But what is the problem exactly? Is there a mistake on pagination data or is it something else like items which are not objects? We don't know. Customizing the message to add problems path and error message may give us more clue about the problem. User schema is missing a property name properties. That's not really useful, unless you are an expert of your guidelines, your spectral rules, JSON schema, and the open API specification, which is not really user friendly. This rule is definitely too coarse grain. Let's see what happens with multiple smaller rules checking individual aspects of our guidelines. That's better. We know exactly what the problem is. Thanks to fine grain rules, we know that the response should be an object with a encapsulated list and blah, blah, blah. In my example, we only have seen warnings, but spectral rules can have different severities. And here's how I use them. Error, that's an actual error. It must be fixed without any discussion, like a 204 no content returning data. Warning, it looks like an error, but it can be normal. Fix it if needed. For example, a post request body without any required property is not normal most of the time, but it can be sometimes. Info, possible improvement. For example, hey, what about adding pagination or search filters to this get slash whatever slash pura name which returns a list? Hint, that's an element that needs to be discussed by API design reviewer and the API team. For example, uh, the use of content type other than application slash JSON that may require specific design and implementation because files shouldn't go through our API gateway. That way, and especially using the hint level, I know where I have to focus my investigations and discussions. And finally, in order to be user-friendly, but most importantly, be maintainable, you have to organize your rules in various rule sets, just like you would organize functions in various libraries. Currently, I have 71 spectral rules organized in 10 different rule sets, 
rules are organized based on what they test. Each rule set can be used individually. For example, if I just want to check security aspects, like if each operation is covered by at least one O of two scope, I obviously use my security rule set. And if I want to use all of my rule set, I use a main rule set that includes all the other ones, thanks to the extends property, which is a list of paths to other local or remote rule sets. As you can see, you can end with many rule sets containing many rules, some of them being quite simple, but some of them being terribly complex. And how to be sure that all of this actually works? By doing tests, as always. And here's a summary of the various test strategy I used along my spectral learning path. At the very beginning, I had a single rule set. I created a single test open API file to check that all my rules were actually working. As the number of rules uh, was growing, it quickly became a nightmare. It was really hard to add new use cases into the huge test of an API file and manually check uh, spectral output to be sure that all expected errors were there. Splitting my rule sets in smaller ones was not only dictated by the need of just organizing rules, it was also done in order to simplify testing. But even after splitting my rule sets and my huge open API test file into smaller ones, it was still painful to add new test case in the individual open API files and manage checks for results for each rule set. Hopefully, Spectral is also available as a Node.js library. Therefore, I created Mocha unit test suites and I used the Spectral library in them. I created one test file for each rule set, still using uh, individual open API files, and I programmatically checked that I get the expected problems. That was better. I even realized that some of my rules were actually not working at all. But even if it was be better, using a single open API test file for each rule set and testing all rules of the rule set at once was too complex and prone to errors. That's why I got a level deeper in my testing strategy. I decided to test each rule in isolation with a dedicated input for each test. To do that, I tinkered with the result of the spectral parser to only keep a specific rule active and so deactivate all the others when running a test. I also managed to be able to uh, use partial open API documents instead of complete ones, making writing tests easier. As the number of rules and rule set were growing, I was fearing to forward testing some of them. So I had it checks to ensure that I have a test suite for each rule set. And at the end of each test suite, I check that each rule has been used at least once. It's not perfect, but it works so far. Also, as my testing became more and more accurate, I realized that some rules were not working because the JSON path in my given rules were totally missing their targets, missing some of their targets, or eating the wrong targets. So I got another level deeper, and instead of testing each rule as a whole, I did dedicated tests for the given rules to ensure that they actually eat what is expected and do not eat wrong targets. To do those tests, I tinkered again inside the result of the spectral parser to get the given JSON path of each rule, and when I use the JSON path plus node library, which is used by Spectral under the hood, so I use this library and some JSON inputs to check that uh, what is written by each JSON path is what is expected. The level of uh, given close testing depends on the JSON path complexity. If there are no filters, I just check that I get what I expect with a simple example. But if there are filters, I do specific checks for each one. I check that I get what is expected, but also that I don't get what is supposed to be ignored. It is especially useful when using regex filters. After all these evolutions, writing tests for my rules and rule set became quite simple. I have a test suite which name tells my spectral wrapper which rule set to load. So it loads it uh, automatically. The sublevel test suite name tells the wrapper which rule will be tested and all the other rules are deactivated. Each test suite is usually composed of four checks based on fragments of open API documents. I check that the given expression actually finds something. I check that the given expression actually ignores specific elements. I check that the rule actually returns error uh, when needed and check that it does not return error when needed. The final check uh, for a rule set consists in verifying that all rules have been tested. 
I have no more than 400 uh, tests to check my something like 70 uh, rules. And that makes me confident. So I don't need to double check what uh, has been checked by my spectral rule set. Um, I can also design new rules very quickly. Let's sum up what we have seen about the design of spectral rule sets. Create your guidelines in the first place. Ensure user friendliness and maintainability by designing your rules, uh, choosing adapted granularity, severity, and organizing them in various rule sets. And do not forget to test your rules like you would test code. Once you have a minimum rule set, uh, start to use it immediately. Do not wait to cover your wall guidelines. Using Spectral in your design and review process as soon as possible will help you to improve your rules and your Spectral skills. It may also give you a few ideas about how to use Spectral in your review process. This happened to me, and now I use Spectral in three different ways. When I receive an API contract for review, I use the CLI to do a quick check and see how many problems there are. If I need to go quickly through all problems and jump from one problem source to another, I open the file in Stoplight Studio. It's a GUI with both OpenAPI and Spectral support. I also use it when designing APIs, but that's another story. To make my rules available in Studio, I just need to add a dot .spectral.yml file in the project and then reference my main root set using extends, directly targeting my Git repository. And so the problem list shows the one detected by my root sets, and I just have to click on each problem to directly go to its source. But all this only works when there are not so many problems. If there are hundreds of errors, and that happens when I do a full review of a very old API, uh, the output of the CLI and the rendering studio is not reusable. Really I need to get stats to know what are different kinds of problems in order to make a summarized review that will be the input of a design workshop. Hopefully, the CLI can output the result as JSON. And I pack that into JQ, a command line JSON processor that allows to do crazy stuff like transforming spectral JSON output into a CSV file that I can import into a spreadsheet. If you want to learn more about GQ, check my blog. There is a post series about it. So once the data have been imported into a spreadsheet, I can easily sort, filter, result, and get some stats. This session was quite intense, and all this was only a brief summary of how I use Spectral. Uh, I use it now on all of my reviews. It really helped me to make a uh, more accurate, exhaustive, consistent, and faster review, and this is only a beginning. I'm starting to provide my rule sets to API designers, and I have many ideas around this too. So what should you retain from this session? Using machine readable API description and API description linter gives excellent results when you're viewing and designing APIs, but you need to work on your rule sets design and testing to actually get those excellent results. Obviously, a linter cannot replace a human being when you're viewing an API design. It will not tell you if the design is accurate to produce or need, but it will save you time to actually focus on that. It will save your time by making guidelines conformance check faster and reduce oversight. It will give you another view of the stylistic quality of an API. It will even give you some hints about things that should be discussed with the API. And we are done. Thank you very much for your attention. That was wonderful. Thanks, Arno. Uh, the It seems a wasted opportunity not to have used a James Bond theme, though. Sorry? It seems a wasted opportunity not to use a James Bond theme. A because James Bond. Called, because is, didn't he, isn't there a spectral movie? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to share the royalties. Um, the, that was fantastic. I think it's really great. I mean, there's a, um, there's a, there's a bit of work to do around, you know, there's only so much that automation can actually um, enable us. And the rest uh, the rest is like, you know, it's like a, it's a skills driven area API design. So like, you know, certainly the um, automation helps speed up a lot of our work, but then that last 20% or, uh, or how much of a percentage would you think it is that it requires you to actually know, you know, the, some of the best styles, some of those best practices and be able to implement and tweak it 
that much. Do you think the automation gets us 80% of the way or? No, I don't think so. Well, once you start to automatize reuse like I do, I think you can gain, at the beginning, you can gain maybe 80% of time because it takes a re an awfully long time just to check that any property is actually in the work in the case. And you miss right. something. Yeah, yeah right. It's yeah. really a, a, a dumb time. So uh, once all of that is automatized, uh, you, you gain you get much time to focus on the real problems like uh do designers actually use uh, actually have a good knowledge of what they want to do with the api which is the most important thing it's it's on that topic that i have most discussion i really torture people to to make them talk about what they want to do and uh, having Spectral uh, backing me up to check all the tiny details uh, is really, really a good help. And now that I, I'm starting to giving it to uh, designers, uh, they can do pre-checks on their own and know that, okay, we have to fix this and that and so on. And so we can have really good discussion on uh, uh, functionalities and user experience because even when you know what you want to do with your api uh, you can still create uh deliver a totally awful developer experience and so we can focus on that but uh yeah it it really helps you to uh gain time to work on that so 80 percent yes when you start from really nothing maybe uh let's say maybe 50 percent uh so yeah but still that's every minute every hour you gain is important because uh people are at the beginning people are not happy doing apis and reviews people don't like that they right. just want to to get some green light okay i i just want the green light to go into production uh, i say yeah sorry but it's too late and you don't need my green light to go into production you, you will just go into production with a shitty API. Are you ready to accept the consequences? So I explain them the consequences and they deal with that. So that uh, having- But it's really cool. Sorry to interrupt. So it's really cool. I love the idea that because you've got access to the to some automated tools, it, move, it means that the developer and the technical engineering team is freed up a little bit to have have the discussions around the uh, to participate in the business discussions and that broader lens of like what's the user experience here. Yeah, and I really hope that I will be able to create more and more rules to go, uh, maybe not to check, but at least to using the hint level, uh, just to say people, hey, you are doing something here that needs that you need to discuss with someone just to check that is, is there a problem or no and i really want to move forward uh because i've written a lot of rules just to check uh stylistic uh quality and that a design conforms to our guidelines but i want to go a step further and be able to write rules that really analyze the design to for example check that uh the wall design is, cons is consistent with itself for example you have uh sometimes you have to read a resource you have to create it you have to update it and the values that are models you use in three different case have to be consistent yeah. that's something that can be automatically controlled and sometimes you I, I think that i could be able to detect wrong design patterns or at least patterns that should be discussed and maybe in the future, I don't know, uh, be able to, by analyzing vocabulary and so on, uh, being able to point things, hey, there is a strange word here. That means, for example, nothing, because we are French, and I can assure you that design <laughs> in English is really not easy, especially when you work wow. in very highly specific business. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. So great to uh, share the stage with you and hear, hear some of these really uh, useful techniques that are, are really practical as far as like there's a lot in what you presented that does uh, that developers listening in today can immediately start using in their tool chain. So thanks a lot for your, um, for your you. presentation. Thank you, everyone. Um,
Thanks. And now I'll invite Alexei from uh, Adyen up on the stage. 